Good morning. Last Lord's Day morning, we began a two-part series on toxic attitudes that have no place in the church, and we'll continue with part two uh, this morning. Just as a quick recap and review, some of those attitudes we investigated last week that ideally ought not to exist in the church, but do nonetheless, given the fact that no church is everything the Lord wants it to be, and some churches do not seem to be trying very hard to reach that high standard of the Lord's expectations. Legalistic attitudes over grace, not to be confused with obedience. Obedience is part of God's plan, but the idea of performance-based self-righteousness and a judgmental spirit based on a human set of rules that forces people to draw hypocritical lines of fellowship in uh, flating themselves while harshly condemning others. We're going to develop that in a slightly different idea this morning. Celebrity preachers, in which you have preachers put on a pedestal that the Lord never designed. And no Christian, no more than a humble servant. We are all uh, here to serve one another. The most important person among us is Jesus Christ. Alone. I'm going to preach without this, so I'm going to I'm going to draw near to the mic here. The prosperity gospel. The Lord has not promised any one of us uh, quick and easy wealth as a consequence of becoming a faithful Christian. Trials are often a blessing. And although the Lord gives us power to get wealth, genuine faith is based on trusting God through every situation including life's most difficult challenges, and we're all going to have them. In fact, the more faithful we are, the more those challenges help us to develop and help us to become the kind of people that God wants us to be. Exclusive cliques. Friendship patterns often exist as a natural part of life among people, and we are naturally drawn to people who have similar backgrounds, personalities, interests, and so on. But the church should be an open, welcoming community, and our idea should be to include, not to exclude. Condemnation of doubt. Everyone wrestles with doubts and fears, and rather than squelching them, healthy churches create a culture where difficult questions are welcome rather than squelched. Overcoming doubts is uh, a part of our journey of faith. Spiritual abuse, in which you have egocentric leaders who exploit their authority to control others, manipulate them. You have exploitation and manipulation of the flock, so to speak, leaving emotional wounds. And uh, unfortunately, this happens in a lot of places. Christ-centered leadership, on the other hand, is servant leadership. And authentic servant leadership never dem demands blind allegiance to mere human beings who are playing power games. Gossip and slander ought not to happen. They do whenever people get together. And whenever people are not embracing the gospel, the church ideally should be a safe environment where people come for healing, comfort, and spiritual growth, even as they overcome problems. And Lord knows we all have some problems. So we want to continue this list today in part two. And one of those ideas that... Uh, comes on the heels of, of the whole idea of, of uh, grace over legalism. 
is compassion over judgmentalism, but sometimes judgmentalism carries the day particularly in, in a legalistic environment. And again, I, I don't believe we're entirely immune from this. When we uphold the idea of strict obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and faithfulness to the blueprint revealed in, in the message of the Bible, it's possible that we come across more judgmental than we ought to be. And it's possible that we not only come across that way, that, that we are that way. Sin has to be condemned. And the first person in which it should be condemned is the one in the mirror. And we should never just sweep blatant sin under the rug in any of us. But while we're trying to embrace the principles of Jesus Christ. We need to be careful about having a Pharisaic hypocritical attitude about that in how we view other people. A harsh, judgmental attitude toward others who face difficult life struggles, lacks empathy and, and support commanded by, by Jesus Christ. In Matthew 23, when he's discussing the Pharisees, Jesus says that they sit in Moses' seat, and therefore, whatever they say you ought to comply with, do and observe whatever they tell you, but do not do the works that they do, for they preach but do not practice. In Matthew 7, as he's winding up the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure that you meet or you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not see or notice the log that is in your brother's eye? Or your own eye, rather. How do you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This is one of the most misused passages in the entire Bible. Again, judge not that you be not judged is not saying don't condemn sin. Nor is it saying don't be a good fruit tester, as Jesus will say in, later on in the same chapter. He says in verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You recognize them by their fruit. You cannot do that if, if you're not discriminating in how you weigh what you hear and see. But the idea of a log coming out of your eye, you imagine a telephone pole coming out of your eye while you take the little speck out of your brother's eye, your sister's eye. And the caricature picture that Jesus paints there. As he's winding up the Sermon on the Mount, he's dealing with, with very difficult principles. And we all have trouble implementing these principles in our lives in this sin broken world. And therefore, patience, long suffering, and even compassion have to be shown toward the other person who is trying to do the same thing that we are trying to do. In James chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, James writes, So speak and so act, as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So should we have a conservative respect for the authority of the Bible? Absolutely. But part of that is a recognition of how far each of us has to go and that we are all a work in progress and that we ought to show mercy toward a brother or sister in Christ who is desperately trying to put on the teachings of Christ but having trouble with that. We ought to offer empathy and support for those who need it rather than a judgmental, nitpicky spirit 
toward those who still have a long way to go. Along with that is fear-based perfectionism. All of us should be aware that the Bible speaks of a hell, and we ought not to be ashamed of, of that idea. Jesus talks about that more than anyone in the Bible. And fear of hell, moreover, is, is one legitimate reason to obey the gospel. You ought to have enough healthy respect for God that you want to clean up your life, be right with God so that you don't spend eternity away from him. Moreover, fear is also a tool used by manipulators to control people. I don't, I don't need to tell you that. In unhealthy situations, fear is used a lot to whip people into shape, to control them in an unhealthy way. And although we never completely outgrow the, the fear of God, which is a, a, a reverential respect, a total respect for God, we never completely leave in the dust the idea that that if we should abandon the teachings of Christ and go back to the world, that we ought to be fearful of hell. Hell ought not to be the primary motivator once we begin living the Christian life and embrace it and, and begin to grow and mature in Christ Jesus. Once we become Christians, we should eventually be motivated more by love than by fear. In uh, 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, John says, beginning with verse 17, By this love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Here's how that works. If you are teeter-tottering with the idea of totally abandoning the gospel of Jesus Christ, of totally turning your back on the Lord, of totally resigning from the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you ought to be fearful of hell. But if you're doing the very best you can to walk with the Lord, then you ought to be motivated by love more than fear. And the love part ought to put the fear in its proper place so that you're motivated entirely eventually by the love that God has for you. We love because he first loved us. If the only reason that you pray on a regular basis is for fear of, of going to hell if you don't, if the only reason that you partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week is to check another box, then you're not doing those things for the right reason ultimately. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, ought to be the prime motivation. There are some environments in which fear continues to be front and center in all the motivations involved, and that is completely out of place for mature Christians. Materialism in church life. Let me say one, let me give you one more passage in uh, the fear thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 and 15, Paul says, For the love of Christ controls us. And just underscore that. The love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Okay, materialism in church life. 
when the church focuses so much on outward appearance and wealth, it strays from the biblical uh, emphasis on simplicity and um, generosity. But there's a sense in which churches are influenced by the world around us if we're not careful. And it's very easy to, to slip into the thinking of the world around us and emphasizing materialistic appearances and worldly comforts. There are some churches and some individual Christians who are fixated with the things of this world. They become very worldly in their materialism. And if we want to build a building that is outwardly impressive to people in the world, then we become worldly in the process. Our motivations are wrong. We can never be fixated with that. There's something to be said for simplicity, for generosity, for abandoning the things of this world in, in, in that regard. We're trying to reach those who have nothing, the poor. But materialism shifts focus off of that simplicity and generosity onto all of the wrong emphases. But if we shift from the inward to the outward, we stray from biblical uh, call to, to simplicity and generosity. Our true treasure is in heaven, not on the earth. Lack of accountability for church leaders. We talked about spiritual abuse last week, and this is the logical uh, foundational opportunity for that happening. When you don't have adequate checks and balances involving everyone, then you end up forming an elite class that doesn't think it's accountable to everybody else. And the truth of the matter is, in the system of Jesus Christ, the church suffers when there's no accountability. And uh, leaders who practice this often subject congregants to abuse. Um, there, there have to be checks and balances. Ephesians 5.21 speaks of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That means I am subject to you and you are subject to me and we are all accountable to each other. When there are no checks and balances, you have a recipe for abuse. And no one is above the law. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, Paul tells his younger colleague Timothy, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So there are some protections built in. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest also may, may stand in fear. And so no one is above scrutiny. No one is above accountability. Everyone should be accountable and open to correction. And again, I am accountable to you. You are accountable to me. We are all accountable to Jesus Christ ultimately. An overemphasis on, on numbers. The Great Commission would teach us to go and to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. And part of being faithful is being fruitful. We talked about that in, in class this morning. To go and bear fruit, and that fruit should abide. But when we focus on spiritual growth, numbers often take care of themselves. If we're fixated on numbers to the exclusion of spiritual growth, then uh, we get skewed very, very quickly. I would like to see bigger numbers. Sometimes that's not possible. The Lord commended the church at Philadelphia, Revelation 3, verse 8, 
you have a little power. Why does he use that term, little power? Many commentators suggest, well, maybe they were not the biggest congregation. Perhaps they didn't have the most resources or the most human capital. That did not mean that they were without any opportunities. And they certainly had the Lord's help every step of the way. Why does Jesus say in Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock. For your heavenly Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. It didn't matter that the flock might be dismissed as little by outward observers. If they have the kingdom of God, they are truly blessed. Sometimes I get frustrated preaching in California. You build up a church and then people move. We have some visitors from Texas. We have Californians moving to Texas all the time and Tennessee and North Carolina and South Carolina and practically every state in the union. If all the Californians in these other states would come back here, we would have a huge church. But that's okay. We have influence that lives on all over the place. And the development of people cannot be reduced to the numbers game. Big numbers tell, rarely tell the whole story. Small numbers rarely tell the whole story. The Great Commission is to make disciples, not just to fill seats. Outward appearances over authenticity. I, I get it. You know, we want to be a model, an example to the world around us. We're, we're operating with the greatest principles on the face of the earth, and, and we want to implement those principles in our life. And because of that, we want to set a good example, right? But what happens if we want to set so much a good example that we, we pretend to be something that we're not? And we don't want to air any dirty laundry whatsoever because uh, we can't let out the, the secret that, uh, you know, some of us might be struggling sometimes. And, and the problem with that is in striving to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, you, you've got this prevalent temptation to pretend to be what we're not or to be less transparent than we should be. And again, what can result from that, if we're not careful, is, is a hypocritical picture to put the best picture forward and to hide the fact that churches and Christians have real struggles, and that's not the answer. Here's where the truth lies. We have a perfect Savior. We have a perfect blueprint embraced by very imperfect people. Have you ever read 1 Corinthians? To the saints who are set apart by Jesus Christ, called to be saints in Corinth, and yet you read on, and, and what do you read? This church is in a mess. Now Paul addresses what needs to be corrected, but it's a mess that needs to be fixed. Or you read Revelation 2 and 3, and Jesus commends churches for things, and he condemns churches for things. But you've got three or four churches there that have some serious correcting to do. Or you open up James 2, and, and James has the audacity to, to mention that there are some people who are catering to the wealthy who walk in the door, and when someone who's poor walks in, through the door, you have a double standard how those people are treated, and you're practically gasping. <gasps> how could he mention that? We're supposed to put our best foot forward and, 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 and represent ourselves a certain way, and yet he's 
he's, he's being transparent and honest about what can and sometimes does happen. Shouldn't happen, but it does. And he's addressing it so that we can become what Jesus wants us to be rather than to pretend that we're something that we're not. And when everything is said and done, we stand in grace. Romans 5 and verse 2. If we stand at all, we stand in grace. And we all desperately need it. One final point, and that is ignoring uh, mental health issues. Mental health struggles are sometimes seen only as, uh, as spiritual problems. And there are Christians who will say, you know what, you know what you need to, you just need to go out and, and, and pray a little more and read the Bible a little bit more. And uh, there may be some truth to that, but that doesn't cover the whole gamut of what ought to be said and done. And I would just say this in that regard, be careful about giving self-righteous, sanctimonious, overly simplistic advice to someone who, who, who may need some help from a specialist. Just as Jesus spiritually uh, healed people, spiritually and physically, we should support a holistic approach to healing in this broken world. Sometimes people come to us and they are an absolute mess. Maybe they're struggling with severe addictions. Maybe their family life is just totally broken. And... Um, we can't leave them dripping wet in the waters of baptism and say, see ya. There may need to be some serious support that is offered in support groups, even specialist help. But, but be aware that as we try to help people in this broken world, there, there are people that come to us with severe financial, emotional, and social ramifications. And um, we need to get our antennas up sometimes more than they are. We really want to help them. Uh, and I don't have all the answers to those questions, but I do know that simplistic, sanctimonious pronouncements will not get the job done. So bottom line, healthy or unhealthy, again, as we saw last week, the church should be a refuge from the world, a realm of healing and spiritual growth. And, and I'm thankful that we have the church. We have brothers and sisters in Christ from which we can draw strength to give our help and to receive our help. This should be a realm of different values from the world around us, a realm of extraordinary love and all-out effort to rise above the wicked ways of the world. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, seek to show hospitality, and the main takeaways are the same ones as last week. Realize the difference between pretensions of perfection and transparent honesty. Support the kind of environment God wants. Humbly confront sin and sinful behavior in the church. Be a catalyst for good. And more than anything else, start by being the person God wants you to be. Get the log out of your own eye. And then you can begin to help your brother or sister get the speck out of their eye. It has occurred to me that there is not enough church in the world too much world in the church. May God help us and may it be our fervent prayer that we can be a community of believers who are different from the world in, in every good way to spur one another on to that, that heavenly home.